Last week, um, Jim started um, our very kind of brief mini-series um, called The Cross and the Crown, and he looked at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we celebrate on Palm Sunday, and that moment really was kind of Jesus' coronation. It was Jesus' public declaration that he is king, okay? But a few days later... <laughs> That claim by Jesus of kingship looked pretty empty. As Jesus hung on the cross, as Jesus has been mocked and beaten and had nails driven through his hands and feet, as he dies a criminal's death, you would have been very hard pressed in that moment to find anybody who was really holding on to the belief that Jesus was king. <laughs> yeah? In that moment, he didn't look like the king that the people of Israel were longing for or the king that he had claimed to be. It seemed very much to be the end of Jesus of Nazareth. And then in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 7, the famous verses, we read this. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. They went to see the tomb. They didn't go to see the man, Jesus. They went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Ironic. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Now, if you've spent any time around church, those will be very familiar verses to you. Okay, but what I just wanted to do for a second is just pause and consider just how outrageous a claim that is. The claim that Jesus, who was publicly crucified, has risen from the dead. It is the most outrageous claim that's ever been made about anybody. And it's a claim that has spread through millennia and across the globe and has been believed by billions of people throughout the ages and by, I'm sure, most of us here this morning. So it's either true or it's the greatest hoax <laughs> in all of history. And if it is a hoax, then Paul writes that those of us who believe it should be pitied. Yeah, we should be pitied, we should be felt sorry for because our hope is in vain because the whole of the Christian faith, the whole of our belief or trust in Jesus rises or falls based upon whether Jesus really did rise from the dead. If he did, so much is true <laughs> and we have this amazing hope. If he didn't, we might as well all grab a cake, grab an egg and go home. And just get on with a life that we ourselves want to live until we die. And then that's the end. Wherever you land on that decision, you've got to land somewhere. Either Jesus is alive and that changes everything. Or Jesus is dead and we shouldn't pay any attention to anything that he had to say. But one thing that the... the, the the question of the resurrection doesn't allow us is to be apathetic about it, <laughs> is to be neutral, is to be agnostic. Well, I don't really know. Yeah, he probably did rise from the dead. That sounds, that sounds plausible. Oh, no, I don't think he did. We've got to come down one side or the other. And so before we make any kind of decision, we've got to consider what the evidence is for the resurrection. 
And so what I want to do just for a couple of minutes is just to do just that, okay? I want you to imagine that this is our courtroom, okay? And the claim of the resurrection, the claim that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead is the claim that we are putting on trial this morning because it's also a claim that Jesus was either everything that he said he was or he was nothing that he said he was. Now, for many of you this morning, I'm sure that you are already convinced of the evidence of this claim, and if so, I hope this will be a reminder and encouragement to you, but I also hope that it will equip you because as the church, we are called to be witnesses to the resurrection, yeah? When you read through the book of Acts, this is what the disciples were. When it describes them as witnesses, yeah, when they talk about their preaching of the gospel, they were preaching Christ raised to life. And so therefore, hopefully, as we look at the evidence, this will equip all of us to Go out and do just that, to be witnesses to the resurrection. But if you're here this morning and you're not sure where you land or you're skeptical when it comes to the resurrection, my hope is that as you rationally consider the evidence that you would come to go, actually, yeah, I think this is true. And then you would consider what that means for your life. So we're going to look at four pieces of evidence this morning. Okay, so firstly, exhibit A, right? We have the witness testimonies of the Gospels, okay? So we have four Gospels, four biographies of Jesus that all record the resurrection as a historical event. Now, if you're in the courtroom, okay, and you're not sure whether this evidence is valid, you may at this point immediately raise an objection. Objection, Your Honor. Bias testimony, surely. Like, how can you put your trust in these scriptures? Surely these guys had an agenda when they were writing it, what's to say they didn't just make it up? They created a myth. Yes, there was this man, Jesus, but they created this myth about his resurrection so that people would have some kind of hope, something to put their confidences in the time, tough times of life. But the problem is, when we read through these biographical accounts of Jesus' resurrection, they don't, they don't read like myth. You know, they're full of historical detail of people, places, processes, all of which are accurate according to other historical resources. And in fact, the historicity of the crucifixion isn't really questioned by anybody, even the most skeptical of scholars who aren't Christians would say, yeah, the the crucifixion happened, no doubt. And yet the narrative describing the resurrection is written in exactly the same way as the narrative that is written describing the crucifixion. And so if we accept the crucifixion as historical fact, why would we not accept the resurrection as well? You see, rather than myth, what these are written as is eyewitness accounts or accounts based on eyewitness testimonies. And they were written while other eyewitnesses around that time were still around. And so actually, if they weren't true, they could have been easily contested, and yet they weren't. By early Christians, by people who knew Jesus, it was widely accepted that his disciples believed that he had risen from the dead. There are a couple of other reasons why the idea that these biographies of Jesus describing the resurrection are made up, and none of them hold very much weight. The first is that if you read through the four accounts of the resurrection, they actually all differ, okay? And It takes a little bit of work to kind of piece them together and work out the timeline and work out how they don't actually contradict each other. Now, if you were planning a hoax or a ruse, yeah, with different accounts of this amazing event, you would make sure they all lined up perfectly so that there could be no questions. So they were all telling exactly the same events. And actually, the resurrection accounts don't read like that. It's like if two people have committed a crime, and they're interviewed separately by the police, but they have talked beforehand, and their stories of what happened in that moment align too closely, the police don't accept the testimony. Because it's clear that they've colluded with one another just to present exactly the same information. The resurrection accounts do not read like that. They do not read. What they read like is eyewitness accounts from different perspectives of the same event. And the second reason why it's very unlikely that these accounts are made up 
is that all the accounts describe the first people to discover that the tomb is empty and to encounter Jesus to be women. Okay, to be women who in this day and age when this was written, their testimony was not credible. So if you were ever going to make up a story to try to convince people that Jesus had risen from the dead, you would never decide to have women being the first people to discover the empty tomb or the risen Jesus. You would have a high priest or you would have one of the apostles. Yeah, you would never choose women. So this was the claim that the women made, that Jesus had risen from the dead. This was the claim that the early church made. And so we have to ask, why then did they make this claim? And we move on to exhibit B, the empty tomb. You see, all the gospel accounts attest to the fact that the tomb was empty. And what is fascinating, okay, again, it's at the time, nobody contested this claim. Now, that's not the same as the fact that nobody didn't believe that Jesus had rose from the dead. But no one challenged the claim by the disciples that the tomb was empty. In fact, if we were to read on in Matthew's Gospel, the account that we just read, you hear the story of the Roman guards who go to the authorities and tell them what has happened. The stones rolled away, the tomb is empty, and they tell them to make up a story that the disciples came along and stole the body. What they don't tell them to do is just to roll the stone back over the tomb and pretend that someone is still in the tomb. So even they acknowledge, we recognize the tomb is empty. We don't have to come up with that story if the tomb isn't empty. Secondly, we know that the tomb is empty because the disciples very quickly began to preach the resurrection of Jesus in Jerusalem, the place where Jesus had died and had been buried. If Jesus was still in the tomb, anybody hearing that message in authority could have gone, excuse me, he's not alive because he's here. They could have opened the tomb, brought out the body, there's the end of the claim, and yet nobody is able to do that. Thirdly, Jesus' tomb was never venerated into a shrine. That was the common practice. When holy people died in that day and age, people would build a shrine around that place and they would revisit that place to remember the holy man. There is no shrine that exists outside of Jesus' tomb because he wasn't there. And so it's pretty clear that the tomb was empty and other claims as to why the tomb was empty, other than Jesus' rising from the dead, don't hold much weight. One of the claims is that thieves came along. So it wasn't maybe the disciples, but thieves came along and they took the body. And yet it was the grave clothes, usually, and the spices in the grave clothes were the things that were valuable to criminals. Nobody cared about the body. You'd never steal the body and leave the grave clothes. And yet the grave clothes were left. The other idea is that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, that he just swooned. And yet all of the accounts are so very clear. They go into very clear detail about the fact that Jesus is declared to be dead. The spear going in his side, the blood and the water coming out. The fact that they went to break his bones, but they discovered he was already dead. And again, nobody seriously questions that Jesus really died. And so we have to ask, why then is the tomb empty. And that leads us on to our third piece of evidence, some shoes <laughs> and some flowers that represent Jesus's post-resurrection appearances. So as recorded in the Gospels, the disciples believed that they had real experiences with the risen Jesus. And what's really significant is that Jesus didn't just appear to one or two people, but to lots of different people on lots of different occasions. He appears to Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, Peter, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, the disciples without Thomas, the disciples with Thomas, the seven disciples at Galilee, James, his brother, 500 people, according to Paul, his disciples at the Great Commission, his disciples at his ascension, and then later on in a vision to Saul who would become Paul. That's a lot of people who claim to have seen the risen Jesus. Now, what is interesting about all of these accounts? Well, again, they are not what you would record if you were trying to create a convincing ruse. Okay, 
Why are they not what you would record? Because to be honest, some of those appearances, some of those encounters are quite odd. They're quite mysterious. Okay, you wouldn't describe made up accounts in those way. People don't tend to always recognize Jesus straight away. Mary doesn't recognize him in the garden. The disciples on the road to Emmaus don't recognize him. Now, if you were trying to convince people that Jesus had really risen from the dead without there being kind of any question against your evidence, you wouldn't make up accounts where people didn't recognize the person they were claiming to be Jesus straight away. Because what's the argument against that? Well, it wasn't really Jesus. You didn't recognize him yourself. So why would you include that unless it actually happens? What you also wouldn't include is the fact that some of the disciples doubt. If you're trying to convince people of this story that Jesus has risen from the dead, you wouldn't include Thomas going, I don't believe it. You wouldn't include the disciples when they hear from Mary going, we don't believe it. You just wouldn't include those things. And yet, they include them because they did doubt. And then they saw and they believed. And so the disciples believed that these encounters they were having were with the risen Jesus. But you might say, well, they were distraught. They were upset. They just saw what they really wanted to see. Or maybe there was just something that they ate. Maybe they were hallucinating. But the problem with that is that groups of people don't have hallucinations. (laughs) Individuals have hallucinations. But groups of people don't have hallucinations. And also people don't hallucinate about things they have no frame of reference for. They only hallucinate about things that they have actually seen And nobody had any idea that Jesus would rise from the dead. And so the only other thing you might say is, well, like we said at the start, maybe they were just lying, just making it up, just trying to create this story that they really wanted to believe was true. And that leads us to our final exhibit, exhibit D, the spread of this declaration that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave that started with these 12 disciples and has reached us and to the very ends of the earth thousands of years later. In the very city that Jesus died, there was, in just a matter of weeks after he was crucified, an explosion of people believing that he was alive and deciding to follow him and worship him as God. Why? Because of this witness testimony of the disciples to the resurrection. Now, the disciples in preaching of the resurrection of Jesus faced significant persecution, beatings, imprisonments, and even death because of what they were preaching. And you've got to ask yourself, Who would do that for a lie? Who would do that for a story that you had made up? There'd come a point in the beatings, the persecution. There'd come a point where they would say to you, look, if you continue to say that Jesus has risen from the dead, we're going to kill you. And this is what happened with disciples in hundreds of years after Jesus. Do you recant of preaching this, if you had made it up in that moment, you'd be like, yeah, all right, you've got me, Gov. I made it up. I'm not willing to die for this story. And yet they were willing to die. Why were they willing to die? Because Jesus had truly risen from the dead. We've also got to ask the question, when Jesus was arrested, all of his disciples scattered for fear of their life. They all ran away. They all abandoned him. They were terrified that they themselves would get arrested by association with him. So how did they move from that place of fear and hiding themselves away, locking themselves away for fear of the Jews, to then boldly going out and proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead? How did they emotionally move from that point? Only if they had actually seen Jesus, only if they'd actually seen him, would they have suddenly been bold to proclaim him no matter what the cost. And then the final thing is the significant change in the religious practice of the disciples and then those who were Jews who put their trust in Jesus. One writer says this, Without the reality of the resurrection, it is unthinkable that the disciples would change so much about the faith that they had inherited. They began to worship a man as God. They ate forbidden foods. 
they associated with people they wouldn't do normally and even changed their main day of worship from the Sabbath, the Saturday, to the Sunday to celebrate the resurrection. These were things that were so like set within their Jewish faith that something seismic must have happened for them to suddenly change. And that seismic event was the resurrection of Jesus. So, these are the four pieces of evidence I want to put before you this morning. The testimony of the eyewitnesses, the empty tomb, the post-resurrection appearances, and the spread of Christianity. And so now I come to my closing statement. You've heard the key evidence. And I believe that when you put all of these things together, actually the most plausible explanation for why the disciples went about preaching that Jesus had risen from the dead is because Jesus rose from the dead. And as I said at the start, whether you, how you respond to that claim is the most important decision you will ever make and one that you cannot remain ambivalent to. Because if Jesus rose from the dead... It changes everything. And the reason it changes everything is that before his death, Jesus made some outrageous claims about himself. Okay, He claimed to be God's chosen one, come to save the world from sin. He came and claimed that he was the promised king. He came and claimed that he was God himself. And that by believing and trusting him, we could have eternal life and a relationship with God. If he died and is buried somewhere, all of those claims mean nothing. All of those teachings can be disregarded and us who believe them should be pitied. Our hope is in vain. But if Christ rose from the dead, all of his claims are validated. So if you sit here this morning and go, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but I am not interested in following him, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, because if he rose from the dead, he is everything that he said he was, and he offers everything that he says he offers. So how can you reject that or shrug your shoulders to that? The, the incredible truth of the resurrection does not allow us that response. Because the resurrection is the seal of Jesus' authenticity. It's God's seal upon him. And if Jesus is alive, he is able to save us from our sin. He's able to heal us from all our brokenness. He's able to open up a way for us to have relationship with God, what we were designed and made for. If Jesus is alive, he's able to hear our prayers and act in response and intercede on our behalf. If Jesus is alive, he's able to bring us peace, security, and comfort, knowing that he is seated on the throne and that he's in control. And even when things don't make sense, he's still reigning and ruling over all things. And if Jesus is alive, we have a hope for eternity and a new creation free from all the brokenness, sin, and suffering of this present world. Because the Bible describes Jesus as the first fruits of new creation, which means in those dark days, we can look towards that first glimmer of light of Christ's resurrection on the horizon, and we can know that a new day is coming for us. Because just as Christ was raised bodily, so we will be raised with him in his new creation. And so I want to finish with this quote from N.T. Wright. He says this, The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth alongside the cross is the heart of the gospel. It is the object of faith, the ground of justification, the basis for obedient Christian living, the motivation for unity, and not least the challenge to principalities and powers. It is the event that declares there is another king and summons human beings to allegiance and thereby to a different way of life in fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures and in expectation of the final new world which began at Easter and which will be completed when the night is fully gone and the day is fully dawned.
So how will you respond? Let's stand to our feet. As I was praying this morning, I just felt reminded that Jesus can be no more alive right now than he is, but that our hearts can be more alive to that reality. (laughs) And so the prayer I want to pray for us this morning is that by God's Holy Spirit, he would make our hearts come even more alive to the reality that Jesus is alive, not just on this day, but every day. And that it would change and transform the way that we do life. Our devotion to him, our devotion to witnessing to him. So Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. We thank you, Lord God, that this is not pie in the sky, hopeful thinking, Lord God. But that all the evidence speaks to the fact that you have risen from the dead. We thank you, Lord, that so many of us have had that validated through our own personal experience and encounters with you. I pray for anybody here this morning who has never had that, that you would just come by your Holy Spirit now and open their eyes and hearts to you. And if that is you this morning, I just want to say don't miss this opportunity. If you've been convinced by the evidence this morning, Jesus is not only alive, he loves you and he wants to be in relationship with you. He died so that you might have life in all its fullness and a hope in him. And so if that is you, I'd love you to come and speak to me or one of the other leaders or someone you came with afterwards. We'd love to talk to you more about that and pray with you. But Lord Jesus, I pray for the rest of us. Lord God, if our hearts in any way have grown dull to the reality that you are alive, we pray by your Holy Spirit this morning that you would awaken our hearts to that truth. You would awaken our hearts to that truth. And that we would live and sing and worship and serve and give and endure and suffer in light of that unchanging truth. And I pray, Lord, help our eyes be forever fixed on that horizon, that new heaven's horizon that we know is coming with all certainty because Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. And we pray that you would help us do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.